Hello, I'm Rosemary Furman, librarian of Hereford Cathedral. This is the first in a series of short films called Medieval Faces, in which we'll look at some of the illustrations in the cathedral's medieval books, and in particular at how human and non-human beings are depicted. All the images you'll see are of things at Hereford Cathedral, especially the books and manuscripts from its chained library, the only library of its type in which all the books are still chained to the shelves. All around the cathedral, inside and out, there are faces everywhere, in the stained glass, stone sculptures, tomb monuments and wood carvings. It's fun to see how many you can spot as you walk around. Yet, there are many hidden faces too, in the normally closed pages of medieval manuscripts and early printed books within the library. These medieval faces, often tiny yet incredibly detailed, drawn with pens or printed from wood blocks, many beautifully coloured, as bright as when they were made, speak to us in a direct way even today. They may be dignified or carefree, princesses or peasants, saints or demons, all have stories to tell. As a starting point, I've chosen a picture from this book. It dates from the early 13th century and is one of the 227 medieval manuscript books in the chain library today. They are the remains of the cathedral's medieval library. The book contains a standard collection of civil law texts, which all lawyers would have studied. There are quite a few law books in the chain library, because many men in holy orders would have trained as lawyers. Some were employed in the royal household or on church business. In these kind of books, you often find the beginning of each chapter marked by a miniature painting, usually relevant to the text, designed to help the user find their way through the book. If you owned this book, you would come to associate a particular chapter with a particular image, and it would help you to remember what it's about. The picture is only a few centimetres wide, but there's a lot going on in it. It's a tiny scene from medieval life. So who are these people and what are they doing? To help us decipher it, let's look at some other pictures which might give us clues. This image from the beginning of another civil law book has some similarities. The central seated figure here is wearing the imperial crown, recognisable by the curved pieces which rise up and meet overhead. He is an emperor. In fact, he represents the Emperor Justinian I, who, in the 6th century, codified the Roman law, which became the basis of European civil law right through to the modern period. He holds the sword as a symbol of his power. We can recognise that the two figures on the right are knights from their chain mail, swords and shields. The two men in civilian clothes on the left are carrying gloves, which suggests that they are men of status, perhaps high-ranking officials. You could read this picture as showing that the emperor has jurisdiction over both matters of war and civil life. It's almost as if he is a personification of the civil law. The artist is making it easy for a contemporary reader to get the subjects of miniature paintings by giving each person props and trappings which signal their status in society. It's not a realistic painting. Emperors don't spend all their time sitting on thrones holding swords and knights don't turn up to meetings fully rigged out in armour. 
Here's the equivalent picture from another copy of the same text. This time, the artist, or the person directing them, has chosen to show a king rather than an emperor. Kings are almost always shown seated. The high status person is the one sitting down, wearing a crown and holding a sword, symbolising worldly power. In these two pictures, we've seen some of the most important people in civil life. But what about the other medieval seat of power, the church? Lawyers would also study canon law, the law of the church, and we have books about that too. At the head of the church was the Pope. This Pope, Gregory I, is also a saint. He not only wears a triple tiara on his head, indicating that he is the supreme head of the church, but also has a halo, signifying his sainthood. He also carries a cross staff and a Bible. This picture is from a very early printed book, William Caxton's edition of The Golden Legend, printed in Westminster in 1483. This image is printed from a woodblock. Even so, his tiny face, created by a few assured movements of a sharp tool across a plank of wood, has powerful character. Next in importance in the church were bishops and archbishops. In this miniature from a copy of Gratian's Decretum, the most widely studied textbook of canon law, we see seated on the left the Pope, his tiara painted red, giving it rather the appearance of a woolly bobble hat, with two bishops standing before him, presenting a young boy. The bishops are identified by their headgear, the mitre, a triangular hat with two points front and back, which is still worn by bishops today. This is from the same book. Here, a sick person in bed is clearly identified as a bishop by the mitre on his head. Realism is not what's important here. The two guys standing by the bed have tonsures. The crown of their heads is shaved, leaving a fringe of hair around the edge. This indicates that they are in holy orders, as clerks or priests. And also from the same book is this rather alarming image. This man has a tonsured head and is not only chopping another man's head off with a sword, but is embracing a forbidden woman. The detail in this tiny picture is amazing, right down to the trickles of blood on the dead man's neck. The text is a legal case study of a clerk who, before ordination as a priest, committed a carnal act with a woman and then, following ordination, killed a man in a rage. I'm afraid it does not turn out well for him. Now, with all this in mind, Let's look again at the image I showed you at the beginning. It's now clear that the central seated figure is the most powerful person. But he's not wearing a crown or a mitre, but a cap with a finial on the top. What does that signify? There's a tomb in the cathedral that gives us a clue. This is the tomb of John Swinfield who was presenter of Hereford Cathedral from 1294 to his death in 1311. And before that, he had been its treasurer. These were the two highest positions apart from that of the Dean himself. On his tomb, John is wearing a cap just like the one in the manuscript. He had studied at postgraduate level at Oxford University and probably at Paris too, and had earned the right to be addressed as Master. He was a nephew of the Bishop of Hereford at the time, Richard Swinfield. The more cynical could say that John's appointment as presenter was literally a case of nepotism, but his CV was impressive. He was highly educated 
and probably as a canon lawyer. As before being appointed cathedral treasurer, he had held the post of Archdeacon of Shropshire, which would have required legal knowledge. This image from another canon law book shows the French canon lawyer Jean Lemoyne presenting a copy of his book, the Glossa Aurea, the Golden Gloss, a commentary on a collection of papal decretals to the Pope. Lemoyne was a close contemporary of John Swinfield and studied theology and canon law at the University of Paris. He eventually became a cardinal, but in this picture he's shown as a scholar. It's that cap again. So far all the pictures we've seen have been pretty serious, but here's that scholar's cap again in a piece of marginalia from another law book. So, for a final look at our image. In the centre is a scholar. This is a work of civil law. So we can take it that he's a highly educated lawyer. On each side of him is a cleric, identified by their tonsures. And on the outside are two laymen with full heads of hair. Look more closely and you can see that each of the clerics is holding up a document with a seal hanging from it. So the picture seems to be depicting a dispute between two parties, with clerics arguing their cases, presenting written and sealed evidence on both sides to a judge. The argument looks quite heated and there's a lot of gesticulation going on. Next time we'll look at what this might mean.